talk about later. All right. <laughs> what are you um, writing for, sis? Um, I'm writing for Philly Word Magazine and um, Empire Magazine. Oh, wow. We're calling this simple. Oh, wow, wonderful. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, I'll, I'll start off with a, a fun question since I cover food and film on uh, Time. Yeah. Yeah. And um, when you were at Black Star, you were saying that you love to be in the editing room, I that did. that's your favorite process. Yes. But what do you eat in there? What a uh, question! Vanessa. <laughs> Anything we can get our hands on. <laughs> Um, my editor and I, um, well, our editing, our edit bay in the middle of nowhere was next to a Domino's. So, but we, we started limiting our, our cheesy bread orders to only twice a week. Because at one point, they will deliver you some cheesy bread. Yeah. Pizza! Uh -huh. Put the F cheesy, cheesy bread. bread. And I said, Spence, you know, I can't do this, you know. It's getting... Yeah, just sitting, <laughs> sitting in he the just, dark, getting right. bigger and bigger. It was like two times a week. I said, okay. Wow. So sometime we get that through it on Monday and Tuesday. And we've been like, no more cheesy bread until next Monday. Sometimes we shut it out. But yeah, you eat really poorly. In the bigger movies, in bigger films, I just found this out maybe about I don't know, six months ago on larger films. They cater. The, uh, oh, the, the editing, editing process? Services for post-production. Oh, wow. Which is something that I never have fathomed because no. I work in a low-budget space. Yeah, my, that would be my, okay. My, 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 I need an extra five grand for my food during the right. day. they be like, crazy. <laughs> so no, we get what we can. I, I think that's coming next, though. That'll be, that, 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 that'll be a lot. I will call you the day that I'm in my own Me edit room too. with my own table of food. <laughs> I will call you and be like, girl, what's happening? <laughs> so, yeah. And, and you, you're in excellent shape. Beautiful, excellent shape. Thank but there, you. You must have something that's like a guilty pleasure. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Like, I mean, I, I like to eat healthy, but I also, I eat whatever I want to eat. You know, but I try to, what I do that works for me is I eat healthier at home and then I eat all the things I love to eat outside the house, you know, so that kind of works for me. Huh. Um, but I love hot Krispy Kreme donuts. They must be hot. The hot ones. <laughs> you know, the they hot must hot be hot. Um, mm -hmm. I love anything beef related. I love steak. Anything beef related. Um, <laughs> See, I've been running into so many people that have given up beef and pork. It's getting on my nerves. <laughs> That she actually eats like a truck driver. I don't know she, if I would say yeah, a truck driver. Yes. She eats like a grown man, and yet still stays smelling. Well, it's not right. Him. It's, it's not, not fair. fair. I don't it's like not it. Right. No. She, you know, it's this, and just I've been with her on press tour for six days, and I, I'm trying to, you know, watch it. I have to watch it, and she's just like, oh, I'll have that. Are we stopping to eat? Can I get something to eat? I was like, yesterday on our press tour, she had a bag of groceries with her. Did you not? <laughs> you. Had Yes. Yes. We were walking into like the New York Times, and she had a grocery bag. I was just like, oh my. Oh, God. you were leaving out. Oh, oh, I love you. This is, no, this is good. She's a lucky, a lucky sister. Yes. Mm, well, yes. If I could eat anything I, would I want, I would. Oh, I would too. Yes. Indeed. My dream. Well, I'm going to piggyback off of her question because okay. I kind of had a similar question. Now it took 19 days to film, but 14 weeks to edit. Yeah. middle of nowhere that's a long time and why yeah. do you enjoy that process so much? um because you get to tell the story again you need to you get to play with all your puzzle pieces and put it together and take it apart put it together and move this over here you know everything's been shot so it's like a puzzle that you're figuring out and so when you're working with the editor like mine spencer we work together on every single thing i've ever shot my mic sounds nice i will follow this is the life you know middle of nowhere we definitely have a shorthand we have fun in the editing room, but it's also being able to look at all the shots. I mean, you see the shots that we chose and selected to be the finals, but you know, they did all these scenes three and four times, right? Okay. So they did them different ways, and you're seeing in a scene half of the first cut, one word from the second cut, right. you cut back to him and it's from a different cut, right? Like it's not all lined up, but we right. put it together to create the, and give the feeling that we want, and that's... Fun. It's like sculpture. Right. It's really great. Yeah. Now, uh, most of the cast saw the film for the first time at Sundance. Is that true? Yes. Dave, um, Amy Atsi and Amari saw it. I set up a private screening for them both in um, in Los Angeles maybe a week before. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. David chose to see it with an audience. An audience. Okay. Um, and I remember the first time I showed I Will Follow to Sally and Omari was at the Urban World Film Festival. Look, if I'm in a film, I'll, I 
I don't want to see it with 50,000 people. You know what I mean? For the first time. Right, right. I want you to show me privately so I can get my bearings. And then, right. But some actors just, you know, they let it go. And they give it into the hands of the actor, I mean, the director, and they can see it uh, whenever. So um, I was, thought it was really important for Emiazzi to see it before alone. Right. Um, so I asked her if she wanted to. I was willing to set it up for her to see it by herself before. And um, she's never made been a lead in the future right. she's in every frame of the film there's some scenes where I'm like this on her face like I want her to be prepared yes. not to have like you know hundreds of people around her when she saw it for the first time yes. so I don't know if that helped or it oh it did it yeah. did help. it did yeah, yeah. so yeah. and how was that for you to see yourself in your first feature length on the screen for the first time it was so many emotions I remember walking out of the screening room and uh um I didn't come out with this huge reaction because it was just so just internal and, and overwhelming and I was still processing it. And I know Ava wanted a, a reaction, but I, I just, I never seen myself in that way, you know, and it just took a minute to process the opportunity, how it came out, you know, because when you're performing, it's just you and the other actor. You don't get to see everyone else and see the whole thing come together. So to see that, it was just like, wow, so that's what everyone was doing, you know, it, yeah. it was fun to finally see it come together. Yeah. Wow. So. Great. Okay, so um, my question is, what is the process, Ava, that you go through when you're um, writing a script? A pride swallowing so, siege. A horrible <laughs> time. I hate it. Wow. Hate writing. Yeah. I hate writing. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't like it. Some people love it. Some people really love the screenwriting process, mm -hmm. hate the editing process. Some people love to shoot, don't want to write, get a script from somebody else. Everyone, every director has it. Some directors love every piece of it. I think I love everything except the writing process. It's painful. It's mm -hmm. it's rough. It's like trying to figure it all out and you know and, and make it mean something and paint pictures just with words. And I have a lot of respect for novelists and people who love screenplays just because I, I don't love writing them. So, um, luckily, you know, my first three films were already written before I made my first film. So, my next film, In Middle of Nowhere and I Will Follow, those scripts were already written. And I wrote them during the time when I couldn't get money to make films. But I could write. No one could stop me from, from typing and, and writing. And, and so, I was constantly writing screenplays before anyone would give me a chance to make them. So now that I'm getting a chance to make them, luckily I have three in the drawer that I can pull out, but I'm about to use the last one. I don't know what's going to happen next, because I'll be damned if I start to try to write another one. It's rough, you know, and it takes a long time, and I, and I think, you know, in some ways I'm afraid it's going to slow down my own momentum, if I'm really honest. So I'm concerned, because I don't enjoy it, so... I don't know if that answers your question, but okay, okay, that works. It's a nightmare. It's the first. <laughs> but since yeah. it took seven years from beginning, from writing to this completion, it must have been a few years where you never even looked at it. Oh, there for, were maybe like, about five years I never looked at it. So when you went short. back in, did you keep most of it? No, or I did you? a bit of pass. Okay. Because the, the script that I had originally was at $2.5 million. This script was made for less than a half million dollars. Ah. Less than half of a half million dollars. Okay, so um, so I had to, you know, make alterations to the script in terms of Ruby walks down the street and you can see the scope of Compton. Uh, we can't afford to shut down all those streets, so let's just have a walk around the corner real quite tight. And, you know, yeah. all of those different changes to the script um, so that it can fit the budget that we had. It kept the core of it, the essence of it, but... Um, so you wind up keeping more dialogue and... Um, changing more scenes. Just the like, places where they're set. set you know what I mean? Set. This was, didn't have any explosions, explosions or stunts or things like that, so it wasn't really an issue. Uh -huh. but like now and then I'd say, you know, she's in the waiting room and hundreds of men come out from mm -hmm. five doors in mm -hmm. the prison, right? Which is how it is in a maximum security. This one was, you know, it was it's a smaller waiting room, visiting room, and he Three prisoners come out. He's a third prisoner come out one door. Uh, Just yeah, those yeah, kinds yeah, of scope kind things. Of you have to go back in and readdress each scene based on, you know, a limited amount of funds. But, but it's, it's probably better to write it as big as possible and then get small and still the other way around, right? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I think I think you know where it's happening is is less important than what's happening and what's being said and what's being conveyed. And so I found that as I was kind of you know altering and tweaking all of the scenes, the heart of the scenes weren't changing. It was just where they were set. 
You know what I mean? And I think if your scene can hold up, no matter where it's set, you know what I mean? The dialogue, the emotion, yeah. what happened before, what's about to happen after, can hold up no matter what size room or what space. Yeah. And you see a lot of films, and part of their aesthetic is what's around it, mm-hmm. less than what's happening. Right. And so, um, so yeah, I didn't change it too much. Yeah. Okay, and uh, my question for Emmy, how do you prep for your roles? Um, any type of music you listen to, any, you know, what was mm-hmm. in that process? That's, that's a really good question. Um, a little bit of, of everything, honestly. It depends on what the character is. You know, there is, sometimes it is music. Like, you know, if there's a certain song that I feel that she would listen to if I'm working on um, a particular scene, I'll have that song help to, to you know, propel me into the scene. Um, I like to write, like, poetry, you know, if, and I write a lot in my journal. Um, and so I found that sometimes that helps if I'm just writing or journaling as the character, you know, what comes out of that. Um... Um, so just a little bit of, of everything, just kind of living as the character a lot. You know, if I go to the grocery store, you know, what does Ruby shop for at the grocery store? Um, so living as the character a little bit before we actually start shooting helps me a lot. Mm. Yeah. What attracted, I'm sorry, what attracted you most to the script? <sighs> um, I'd never seen this kind of story told in this way before. Um, I know women who have significant others that have been in prison, um, and I've, I've just never seen this kind of story told. So when I read the script and I thought of the women that I knew, it was like, it made me want to go and ask them, well, what was your story? You know, so that's really what excited me about it. And then the fact that there was this, this role for, um, for a woman who has this full and complete journey, you know, she becomes a different person, that also doesn't happen a lot. So those two things together at one time, it just made me feel like, you know, I would love to be a, a part of this. Yeah. Um, I haven't gotten to see the film yet. I'll be going with Real Black on the 12th. But, um, <laughs> but I do understand that part of the, part of Ruby's um, experience or, or her background is that she's given up her medical career mm-hmm. while he's while Derek's in, in prison. Mm-hmm. Do either I want for both of you to answer? Um, could you ever see yourself putting your dreams on hold for another person, like either now in your career or even earlier on? See, the thing with Ruby is. That was never the plan, you know. It was, okay, I'm going to take a semester off just to get things in order, to be home when you call. You know, that was the plan. Um, and so it ended up being, here we are four years later, and what? What happened? You know, didn't, didn't finish. So what, it was never that. Um, she wouldn't be that kind of woman to just say, okay, this, I'm just, this is it, I, I give up. You know, she never gave up in that sense. So that's how, for me, the her journey really became... Um, kind of a, a discussion on what happens when all of a sudden you look up, you make a decision, and you look up and you see, how did I get here? I'm in the middle of nowhere. How did that happen? So that was really what, what happened. It wasn't a conscious decision to, she never quit or gave up. Okay. I think I can. I can see myself giving up my dreams for someone that I love. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Um, I think that but, some of what we explore in I Will Follow, if, if you've seen I Will Follow mm-hmm. it, you know, the makeup artist May, you know, puts her career on hold to take care, you know, to take care of her aunt. We find ourselves in these situations where we have to make those kinds of decisions. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people are, you know, have gone through it or will go through it. And those are the crossroads where you find out what you're made of, I think. And the question that we ask in the middle of nowhere is when do you, how much is too much? Mm-hmm. You know, when does mm-hmm. it cross over into martyrdom? When does the sacrifice become... Um, harmful to the person that's making the sacrifice. And so those are some of the things we explore in in middle. Um, I think, you know, the questions that we're all going to have to face at some point. So is that like the ultimate goal of the film for the film goers to walk away with is, could you just explain? Like, what do you want them to take away from Yeah, I mean, those are some of the ideas and many ideas. I mean, that's one of the reasons why writing a screenplay is so difficult because it's really kind of synthesizing a lot of ideas and really as an artist saying, what do I want to say with this? You know, I think that's the best film. The best films, the best stories are the ones that someone's thought about it and have been, you know, somewhat responsible with what they're trying to convey. Now that'll also be positive, but don't I don't have two hours to spend on you, whatever you spouted off. Like, put some thought into what I'm watching. And so that's why I take the writing so seriously and why it's kind of burdensome because it, I put a lot into it. But I think, uh, so that's 
part of what I use to write it, but it's not necessarily what I want people to get out of it. Like, I really feel like a film is an open space, and people come with their own kind of memories and legacy and ideas and whatever happened to them that day and what they, their father said to them when they were four or whatever, and they're going to see different things. In, in the film than someone else would see. I mean, I see Beast of the Southern Wild and I see something completely different than she might see. You know what I mean? Um, that's what, you know, film debate and film criticism is all about. So I would hate to say, I want you to see this, feel this. My goal is feel something. Mm -hmm. You know, don't walk out of the movie and forget it three, five minutes later. Mm -hmm. That's not what I want. Mm -hmm. I want you to feel something. I want you to think about it the next day when you're washing the dishes. I want you to talk to someone about it and tell them what you liked or didn't like, but to have some emotion around the film is all I ask for. Um, well, that was part of a question I had, and I have yet to see the film either, but um, I viewed the trailer several times, okay. and a quote stuck with me that um, is the past has disappeared and the future doesn't exist until we get there. What made you... Is that a theme of the mm. movie? Mm. And is that part of the message that you want the audience to carry away from the film? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think it's it's one of the things. It's one of the things that's being explored, or the things that tie us together. You know, a lot of them is expectation, which is a big part in the film. Mm -hmm. That's what you'll see a lot when you watch the film um, in the struggles between the mother and the daughters, mm -hmm. right? So Lorraine Toussaint's character and and Imiatsi and Edwina, they have this big kind of struggle with their mother over her expectations that haven't been met, yes. right? Yes. And then with, um, with, uh, with, with Ruby and her husband, it's really about expectation as well. She's expecting him to do a certain thing while he's incarcerated, to serve good time. He's expecting her to, you know, do certain things on the outside. All these kind of unwritten expectations about what's supposed to happen. And they're all ether, they're all imaginary, nothing's rooted in what's really happening. You know, the past, you know, it's rooting in memories and it's rooted in hopes. And that's not what's happening right now. You know what I mean? Right. Memories right. of the past and hopes of the future. And, and so I think one of the things that we explore is to focus on the present. Okay. And I would say I'm asking this next question from my female audience, but that would be a lie because it's for me. Can you both describe <laughs> how it was working with Omari Hardwick? <laughs> that's a me question. Well, oh, girl, bye. listen. <laughs> Is Amari and David. They they are both gentlemen. You know th that was the the thing that really just stuck out the most. Um, I known Amari prior. You know, just on the acting circuit, he used to host um, a, um, an actors like monologue okay. space. You know, so I knew him from that. And uh, to actually get the chance to, to to work with him was just wonderful. I mean, he was a gentleman. He's handsome. He's kind. He's a great actor. Um, everything that you that you might think of, you know. So to have both of these of these men, you know, on on either side, it was like, okay, you can't tell me. Nothing. <laughs> Yeah, it was nice. <laughs> um, I have worked with Amari, and I will follow. Yes. Up, and he um, is just a great brother. You know, definitely a consummate artist. Really, um, very focused. Yes. We have a good shorthand. Okay. Um, he doesn't mind. Uh, you know, being vulnerable, which I think is really you know not what we see in a lot of our black men. Yes. You know, on film, film they have to have a certain swagger. Yes. Um, and so. Okay. And so, um, and so, yeah, he brings that strength and vulnerability. He's got the guns, the tats, yeah. the face, the body, but he's also giving you, you know, some depth, which is really important. Um, and then with David, he's just such, so gallant, gallant, yes, and yes. so just suave, and um, and he's that way in real life, just uh, very polished. I and, lo um, loved him in Red Tail. Yes. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah very really polished young. brother, yeah. but it's just yeah. very um, down to earth as well. So, yeah. loved working with both of them. Mm -hmm. Really great guys. Awesome. Um, you all went to Toronto just a couple of weeks yeah. ago. So, um, what else did you see? Did you see things together as a cast? Do you see other films together? And what, like, what have been the favorites? We got to see one film in, in Toronto. Yeah, we saw more together. films together at Sundance. Yeah, uh, in Toronto okay. we had a very tight very schedule, yeah. and um, I'm sorry, you guys, I can't really <laughs> focus. Um, we had a really tight schedule, so unfortunately we didn't have a chance to see a lot. And David had to fly out because he's shooting The Butler with uh -huh. Oprah and Forrest. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. And so he opened for us. Like, I know. Um, but um, so, but Emmy and I snuck out uh, the, our final night.
night at midnight, mm -hmm. and we saw a midnight screening. The only thing we could get tickets for with our first AC Hans. What was the film called? I'm trying to. The children cry out, or I don't. We, it didn't even matter. We just went to, just to see a movie together. Yes. Yes. We saw yes. something. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. While but, you're at, there. but at Sundance, we saw we saw Love. We saw, um, uh, which uh, is a great film by a film maker, Sheldon Candace. We saw a film called End of We saw maybe about six or seven films yeah. from our Sundance class, the class mm -hmm. of Sundance filmmakers. Mm -hmm. It's always fun to, to, to watch independent films with other filmmakers. With the other, yeah, right, right, I mean, yeah, it's just, yeah, it's great. And because the Philadelphia Film Festival is opening October 18th, and oh. they make their announcement on Thursday oh, wow. of, of the That's lineup of deal. films. So I thought if you knew one that I should be looking for, oh, I kind of well, I'm gonna see the films, and then I'll this okay. one, yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. We've seen a lot this year. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, so piggyback kind of on what she said. Um, have, did you get a chance to see the art of rap? You did something I about did. females. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah, I saw the art of rap. It was okay. good. It was cool. Yeah. Um, and one of my last questions is: any advice for any aspiring, you know, filmmakers, writers, uh, or actors? You know, it's a question for both of you. Uh, yeah, my advice is: don't wait. There's nothing to wait for. There's nothing coming that's going to make it easier. You have to mm -hmm. pick up the camera. You have to put your hand, your keys on the your hands on the keyboard, and you have to start. You know, you have to begin. You know, whether that's a short or a video or a documentary or a feature is up to you, but you, you have to begin. I think my frustration is meeting folk who want to and are aspiring to, and there's a time for that. And you have to train and you have to study and you have to prepare yourself. But, you know, I, I prefer that time to be shorter uh, than other people. I was talking to our cinematographer, Bradford Young, who said, no, we need to have rigor. People need to study. People need to take more time. I'm from the school of pick up the camera and start, you know? And so different people have different thoughts about it, but for me, my advice would be, you know, um, time, time is short, life is short, things change. Find out if you even like this first. You know what I mean? Pick up a camera and start, you know, before you go to film school for four years and decide, uh, this is not really what I wanted to do. Try it out first. And um, so yeah, that's my advice. What's yours? Um, my advice would be to, to keep going. I would, I would tell any actor to keep going. Sometimes it can just be daunting, you know, all the no's. You go through 20 no's before that 21st, it's a yes, but all those 20, I mean, they hurt every single time, you know, and you, a little bit of you, you know, can be chipped away every time. So I would say just to keep going, um, to trust in, in, in the gift that you have, the talent you have, and believe in it. And to just don't give up. You know, for me, it's, I've been, I'm from Jersey originally. Um, Army Brat lived all over the place. You know, and so for me, living in California, I've been out there 10 years now, you know, acting. And so to now have my chance to be a lead in, in a film, um, I had to just keep going, you know. So that's what I would say. Thank you. Thank everybody. you. Thank you so much.